It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, there's going to be a number of folks talking uh, throughout the evening. Uh, but just want to get started and talk about three things that's really important about this project. We're going to be talking about lead paints and lead poisoning. Uh, obviously, the topic in itself is intrinsically uh, important to us in terms of the population who's even being impacted, usually our youngest throughout the city. And it's a severe problem that can really impact the development of a child. Second, what's also impactful about this project is that this, is the this project started about four years ago, and it started as a collaboration with Data Science for Social Good. Raid Ghani, who couldn't be here this evening, uh, started Data Science for Social Good here out of the University of Chicago, which every single summer brings together some of the top-notch fellows, data scientists, uh, social scientists, public policy experts who are graduate students, undergraduate students, postdocs, that come here to Chicago to do work. When Raid and I, some years ago, were talking about the dream and the vision that he had around data science for social good, we were eager to figure out how can we use such a pool of talent and bring them into Chicago and really make an impact on the city of Chicago. And tonight was one of the first projects that they ever worked on, and it's the first project that we've ever really been able to deliver here in the city of Chicago and be able to deliver as a service. So that community, that thing that we always talk about, that we always talk about from the city of Chicago, working with others who, who can do good work, who can really contribute to their community, it really come full circle with this project. And then finally, I'm really excited to talk about the way that we're tackling this problem. We've talked about before with data science projects, the technology is often the easiest part. To do the predictive model is obviously the easiest part. Now, the data scientists that work on this did a fantastic job on it. They really did, and it's an impressive bit of statistics and data science that has come together and bringing able to bring data together. But this project took four years, not because it took that long to model the problem, because it took a long time to really figure out, to validate, and figure out how we're going to be able to deliver action with a predictive model within this context. We've done other predictive models that we've talked about here before, whether or not it's predicting where rats are, predicting which restaurant's gonna fail food inspection, where West Nile virus is gonna be, or elevated E. coli levels. What sets this apart is this collaboration that we have with outside parties, in particular hospitals and clinics, who are actually gonna be able to do the work using the data and the predictive model that we have in a city. So it's using technology to bridge a gap. And so I'm really excited to hear about that today. And we're first going to start off uh, here from Dr. Arwadi, who's the Chief Medical Officer for the City of Chicago, to talk about the threat of lead and the lead threat throughout the City of Chicago. So, doctor. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, so raise your hand if you've read something or heard something or something has gotten on your radar recently about lead poisoning. Okay, so just about all of you. That's sort of what I was expecting. Um, I'm going to take less than five minutes and just give you a little bit of context for why at the Chicago Department of Public Health we care a lot about lead poisoning um, and just to set the stage for some of the discussion that's coming next. So, first of all, uh, so lead poisoning is one of the most common and one of the most preventable causes of pediatric environmental contamination that exists. Um, and when we think about lead poisoning, there's one source that by and large is the cause for most children here in Chicago um, and in the U.S. in general. And that is housing. So we use leaded paint. Um, for many, many years here in the U.S. It was outlawed in 1978. Any home, business, building that was built before 1978 is really considered to have at least some leaded paint uh, in, you know, usually for interior, sometimes for exterior, sometimes on porches. And um, when that paint is not necessarily in good repair, so like as you can see here, when you start to have peeling paint, that peel can turn into a lead dust. Sometimes it's actual flakes, but sometimes it's enough to get the dust that's gonna be in the home or in the soil. And that leaded dust is a problem, especially for young kids. So lead itself is a poison, it's a neurotoxin. Um, it can affect sort of any system of the body, but we worry about it the most in very young children. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is because young kids have the most rapidly developing brains and nervous system. And so when there's exposure 
exposure at that early point, there's more potential for long-term outcome. And we can see things like problems with developmental disabilities. We can see um, potentially more ADHD. We can see um, some more physical manifestations if the levels are higher. But by and large, no level is considered sort of a safe level for a child. And young children not only are more susceptible in their developing brains, but if any of you have been around toddlers and young children, what do they do a lot of? They put their hands in their mouth, right? They like to pick everything up. They sort of experience the world by tasting it. I'm a pediatrician by training, and um, this is just what kids do. And so the problem is that if you're in a home that may be a little older, um, maybe has some of this paint that may not be in good repair or just has the leaded dust, those kids are picking it up, putting it in their mouth, um, and potentially getting exposed to lead paint. So that is the number one way, by and large, how lead poisoning happens in Chicago. About 80% of our homes here are built pre-1978, which means all over the city, kids are considered at increased risk for lead poisoning. The recommendation is that every child in the city of Chicago, no matter what neighborhood they live in, no matter what their background, should be tested by their pediatrician for blood lead levels. And then if those are identified to be elevated, um, the health department gets involved. We go in, we do an investigation, we see where the lead paint may be coming from, um, and then we work to get that mitigated and sort of re reduce the risk so that we identify kids before lead poisoning uh, gets, you know, gets to high levels. So understand that? All right, so good news is that lead poisoning rates have been decreasing, and this is a really a good news story in a lot of ways for public health. If you look back over the decades, it wasn't just that we got rid of lead paint um, in the 70s, we took lead out of gasoline, if you think about unleaded gasoline. Um, we, there's been a lot of change over time once this was really recognized as a toxin. And so this, this is data looking, this happens to be from 2001 <laughs> to 2011, and the blue line here is showing that back in 2000, we had about a third of kids had a blood lead level, meaning, you know, in their blood um, of at least 10. That's just, uh, um, I'm sorry, of at least five. That's one of the uh, cutoffs that we use. And that's come all the way down here to a point where, you know, less than 5% of kids now have that elevated blood lead level of five. And the green is a blood lead level of 10, which is worse. A higher level is worse. So this is really nice progress. And in a lot of ways, we say, fantastic, right? Like, we've been making environmental change. We've been doing public health intervention um, and uh, doing lots of screening, doing what we're able to. Good progress. However, that progress is not necessarily universal across the city of Chicago. And this is not going to be, you know, you've probably, if you've ever looked at maps of Chicago, you know that there often are a lot of disparities. We see that same thing in lead. So on the map here, we know that 3.5% of Chicago children under the age of three have an elevated blood lead level, okay, across the city. But in these areas that are red here, um, the levels are higher, and in some cases, as many as 10%, or one in 10 kids in that community, has this elevated blood lead level. So we already know that there are parts of the city where kids are living, where the housing stock may not be as good, for example, or you know, in as much repair, um, and uh, other things that are making those kids potentially more likely to have an elevated blood lead level. And we do some work at the health department looking at childhood low opportunity index which pulls in lots of things around um, the environments that kids are growing up in. And we know kids in those low opportunity index neighborhoods are five times more likely to have this elevated blood lead level than kids in high opportunity neighborhoods. So problem, we want to work on health equity, we want to focus potentially um, on these kids who are at highest risk. And so, um, this is my last slide, the idea of innovation was to start to move the health department from a reactive model. So the way it works right now is if a pediatrician checks a child's blood for lead, which they're supposed to do for every child that they see who lives in Chicago. All of that data gets reported to the health department. So we get every blood lead level. And when it is above a particular level, the health department literally goes and knocks on the door and starts to intervene and figure out what the problem is. But that's a reactive model, of course, because in some ways, you know, those kids already have at least some level of an elevated blood lead. And so the idea is to start moving to a more proactive model where lead can be identified in a home 
And we can work on that lead mitigation, getting rid of the hazard before that child ever has a significantly elevated blood lead level. And so that was sort of the setup for the questions that this team was looking at. How do we take the large amounts of data that we're getting in, think about what we can do to better predict the kids who are most likely to uh, develop an elevated blood lead level and then get into their home and sort of figure out what the issue is and hopefully fix it, um, ideally before they're ever lead poisoned. All right, so I will next turn it over to Rayad Mansour, who's going to talk about identifying the problem. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awadi. Um, she set up the environment nicely, but I'm going to take it a step back and tell a little story about how we brought this uh, partnership and this collaboration together. Um, Back in 2013, when Tom uh, introed uh, this uh, presentation, we heard about this guy, um, Raid Ghani. Um, if anyone's ever met him, uh, he doesn't wear a jacket in the winter. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> when I first met him, he had his sleeves rolled up, and it was December. And he walked in that way, and I said, where's your jacket? And he goes, I don't wear one. Um, so that's how we were introduced, but we heard about him in DSSG. And uh, we heard he was uh, previously uh, President Obama's chief data scientist from the 2012 campaign, and other people were recommending him. And so we wanted to work on analytics, and um, at this time, I think food was starting. And, um, we didn't even know how to write DSSG right. I think we said DSFSG. <laughs> we didn't know him too well. So we, we listed some problems we had. It was, he was in the room. And um, uh, you can see the top four that he kind of focused in on. And uh, this was in 2013. And we said, where do we sign up to see if we can apply? He goes, no, we're going to do this one for the next 2014 fellowship. So I call this. Um, uh, the proof of concept, if you will, uh, they brought together a lot of data. Um, it wasn't operational. I think the important thing was is to see if we can bring these desperate data sets together and see if we can actually build something out of it. The thing that's missing here is operationalization. How does it work within the city? How does it work outside the city? Um, partnerships are very important. Uh, you don't go along to get along. Uh, so we had to pick the right partners. We've always had a good relationship with Tom Shank and his, uh, 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 the Department of Innovation and Technology and his team. So that was a given. Um, and this proof of concept worked well. At the same time, Raid was switching DSSG and creating uh, the University of Chicago Center for Data Science and Public Policy, where he's the director. So DSSG falls under there. Am I right? Yeah, good. Um, so they built this proof of concept, uh, the fellows, and they did a great job. And it was written in R, and then Joe and Avishek turned it all into Python. <laughs> and um, uh, they took it to the next level. But we needed a way to extend it out into the community. Uh, we needed partners to improve impact, collective impact, not only with the Department of Public Health, but how do you integrate health systems into the environment of public health? How do we push data that's needed outside of just the government in a, in a way that's usable? It's fun building predictive models, but if they don't meet an unmet need, there's no reason to build them. So we know that doctors can use them, physicians, healthcare providers can use them, the pediatricians, and OBGYNs. So there was a, a, a good case here and an opportunity um, to bring this team together with Alliance Chicago. You'll uh, need to introduce herself and she'll discuss more about Alliance Chicago. Um, but uh, with all these partners together, building the analytic model, the data, the database, the model, and the API built in the city extended out to physicians. So we have now upstream prevention. It's not waiting for, for the child to be poisoned, like Allison stated. We're doing something that has a potential to prevent it. And uh, um, the important work that DSSG brought uh, to uh, the project was tremendous. But we learned a big lesson on how to communicate to physicians 
electronically um, through their electronic health record. So Alliance is a great uh, partner, and uh, she'll explain the FQHC's uh, community clinic model too. Um, so this was uh, a grant that Joe and I and uh, another person who was uh, director of informatics at the department, Matt Roberts, but uh, wrote a grant um, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And um, uh, it helped us validate uh, and operationalize and uh, fund uh, this project across the board with all these partners. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Avishek, who's a data scientist at the center, and he will explain the analytic model. Hi, I'm Avishek Kumar, and I'm one of the many data scientists that have worked on this project over the years. Um, and so I've been involved in operationalizing the lead predictive model. So this is what we're hoping to accomplish. So when you have a child that's born, after around 12 to 48 months, that's when they begin crawling. And when they begin crawling, that's when they start putting everything in their mouth. And so that includes lead dust. So at that point, they're taken to a doctor and their lead levels are checked. And if they have an elevated blood lead level, that triggers an inspection from the Chicago Department of Public Health. From there, um, if there's a lead hazard found in the home, then that triggers a remediation. Now, the problem with that is that that child has been irreversibly poisoned. So what we hope to do is have a predictive model that will find uh, they are at high risk before they're poisoned. So at the time of their birth, we want to make a prediction. Now, if they are at high risk, we then want to have an inspection and then find hazards and remediate them before they are ever exposed to lead paint. And so through that proactive approach, we are avoiding children sort of being poisoned. Okay, so then the question is, with our sort of proactive approach, where do we actually take our limited resources and inspect homes? So this is a map of the city of Chicago and all lead poisoning cases in 2012. And you see these are actually spatially clustered toward the south and west sides. But even if you went to the um, neighborhoods that had the most amount of lead poisoning, you would miss out on every other neighborhood. So that is where a predictive model comes in handy where you can make an individualized prediction of a child and assess their risk of having lead poisoning. So this is our model. So the top is all our data that we turn together and we featureize and make a predictive model. So the type of data that we use to actually uh, predict these things. So every child in the city is supposed to get a blood lead level test. Um, for between 12 to 48 months and a year before they enter uh, CPS. So we had over 3 million of these tests for over a million children. Now, a fun sort of aspect of doing these types of projects is the data you receive is never collected for the purpose that you're doing this for. So this is sort of a major record linkage project where we had to link blood tests for children, and then we had to link those children to addresses to see where they actually lived. So we were able to find about 78% of the records matched to a single child, and of those records, we were able to match them to 96% of the addresses. So then we have uh, over 120,000 lead home inspections done by the city of Chicago. So we know when the initial inspection happened and we know which homes were then compliant with the lead safety standards. Now this is important for our predictive model because this gives us our sort of positive and negative examples that our model can learn. Okay, and then thirdly, we can then use the Open City, um, the City of Chicago's Open Data Portal to actually get information on the building, uh, the buildings of the City of Chicago, so we can see how many floors they have, how many units they have, the property value, uh, and how old buildings are. Now, and then finally, we need sort of demographics from the American Community Survey. 
So we can then use the American Community Survey to find things like the poverty level in a neighborhood, the education level of the people living there, the percent of home ownership, and the ethnicity of the people in those neighborhoods. So we take all that, all this data, and then we sort of churn it together, and then we can aggregate this over different spatial levels. So the most basic level is an address, and then we can combine this into different complexes, and then we can then aggregate this to census blocks, and then uh, census tracts, which are bigger, and then the city of Chicago's uh, 50 wards. And then from there, we can make variables through space and time, and we can see how the pro problem of lead poisoning is changing sort of through space and through time. And so then these are our predictive variables where we can form about 2,000 variables, and we found about 800 of them were useful in the predictive model. And so they include this sort of number of tests the child has had, whether a child has ever been tested, whether a child has been poisoned at a certain address, the um, count of the max blood lead level of a child in an ad at an address, the minimum blood lead level count in an address, um, the number of kids that had been poisoned at an address before, and sort of the proportion of, say, children that had been poisoned, and say, at an address, or a complex, or a census tract, or a ward. So then the question is, now that we have a model, how do we evaluate it? So now what we want to do is create a list that maximizes the Chicago Department of Public Health impact. So for that, we wanted to come up with the Metro Precision at K and find the thousand riskiest homes um, that would have lead hazards. Now what that means is that when we give the Department of Public Health a list, every time they go to a home, we want to make sure that they find a hazard. And so that's what Precision at K is finding. So what this graph shows is precision over a count of children. So now what Precision says is, every time I say yes to a child, are they going to be poisoned? How right am I? And so our precision around 200 to 400 is about 25%, and we can compare that to a baseline. So if we just randomly chose homes in the city of Chicago, we'd be a little bit less than 5%. So you see you're getting a significant lift from a proactive approach. And so the variables that we found to be most predictive are the age of kids, the number of tests they've had, um, their date of birth, the amount of kids that had ever been poisoned in a census tract over the last four years, and sort of things like the max um, blood lead level that had ever been found in a census block. And so this, led, uh, this helped us predict and sort of better allocate the resources at the Department of Public Health. So now Tom will talk about the API we've designed. Okay, so we've identified, we've identified the problem. We've identified partners to help develop the model. We've developed the model itself, which seems to prove out of, of having a sufficient level of precision to help us out. But how do we actually connect that to the action of intervening with children? Now, one of the challenging aspects of this is that these are people's individual private homes. It's not a business that we can walk into and just do an inspection. It's also a heavy-duty inspection. And this is the responsibility of the city, to go to homes to be able to inspect. But how do we find those homes where it is not too late, especially when we're trying to get ahead of the curve? Meanwhile, we have clinics and hospitals and doctor's offices who are seeing patients on a regular basis. And so they're interacting with families and their children. Now, at times, they are doing blood tests as they should, maybe sometimes not, but they're doing this process, and we're doing this side by side. And there hasn't so far been a great amount of communication between the two. Clinics and doctor's offices seeing patients, the city conducting uh, inspections at homes. Now we do get, the city of Chicago does get blood lead level tests. We get those via an intermediary through the state to be able to get that information. But again, there's a time delay there and it's not immediate. So we've launched the Lead Safe API. 
And this is an API that's going to be a free service available to clinics and hospitals and health networks in the Chicago area. And it's a free API that uh, hospitals can sign up for. It's only available to uh, uh, health networks. It's not available to the public, but it's something that will be free available to them. And that will allow clinics and hospitals to be able to send information to us where we can be able to turn back within a few seconds what is the prediction, what is the likelihood of risk of lead paint poisoning for that child. And then at that point, the doctors, the clinical staff is going to be able to talk with the parent in a way that we just can't do from the, the standpoint of government of talking through what that risk is and ordering a follow-up lead paint inspection, a visual inspection. And this is the workflow. A family comes in with a child who's under one years old or even a pregnant mother themselves for, for their future child, being able to come in. When they do come in, that a little bit of patient information gets sent to us. It goes through an analytical model, gets stored in a database where we're going to store what the predictions are, and then we're going to come back with what the actual prediction is to that clinic, all within a few seconds. If it's shown to be elevated, the health network is going to be able to reach out to us. There's going to be instructions to the doctor, which will be covered here in just a second. So to contact us so we can go out and do the visual inspection that we need to do to see whether or not we can identify that lead paint source. So it's using that piece of technology to be able to bridge that gap that exists between the clinics and the health networks and the city of Chicago and the inspections that we can do. Now, there is documentation on this publicly. I shared this within a Slack channel yesterday. If you've just joined Slack, you can see what that documentation is. Is at dev.cityofchicago.org if you want to take a look. But this is basically what's submitted to us. The address and zip code, as, as Abhishek just described, is very important. The date of birth, as you saw, depending on the date of birth, there's a certain risk uh, level to you. And also, a child has to be under one years old or expected due date if it's an expecting mother, the gender of the child, the race, ethnicity, information about the past visits to the doctor's office, and also the past lab results from that child who may have had blood test uh, results beforehand. And that comes into the city, we take that information, and again, within five seconds, we return back a prediction through an API exchange that returns back the risk score itself, a relative risk ratio in particular, and then instructions to the doctor if we see that it's an elevated risk, to provide instructions in the phone number that they should contact to be able to order the visual, uh, uh, visual lead inspection, visual paint inspection. Now, eligibility, it's healthcare facilities that uh, are in the Chicago area. And you have to have a clinical point of contact, somebody who knows the science and the medicine behind this, and a technical contact who will lead the integration with our RESTful API, and we will work with uh, those partners to be able to hammer out any technical issues or concerns. Again, the API is publicly documented, so we hope that this is a fairly seamless process. Patients who are under one years old or expecting mothers are eligible for the Lead Safe API because that is that target age range where the risk is very high before they get to the hand-to-mouth behavior and potentially ingesting uh, fragments of lead paint. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the link to the, actually the application site for the API, but you can see other documentation about it itself. So we've been very happy to be able to partner with Alliance of Chicago as the initial site. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Mohadi, who has been our uh, partner and collaborator with this. And so here you are, Doctor. Thanks so much. Um, what's really exciting to me about this project is I get to wear two hats for this project. Uh, one hat is as Chief Research Officer for Alliance Chicago, and the other is as a practicing pediatrician who sees kids like this every week who have been exposed or who live in areas of low child opportunity. Um, has anyone here ever heard of the concept of a community health center or a federally qualified health center? Okay, great, a few do, that's awesome. So uh, federally qualified health centers, um, the health center program is a uh, program that's funded by the federal government um, and receives bipartisan support to allow communities to have access to healthcare for some of the country's most vulnerable populations. Um, we at, in Chicago, have, at Alliance Chicago, were formed by four of these community health centers that really came together to share resources for the benefit of some of the the most vulnerable communities in Chicago. One of our areas of focus is on health information technology. We provide the health information technology for what's grown from four founding health centers to about 200 clinical delivery sites across 19 states. 
Um, we really feel strongly that our mission is to use health information technology to improve public and community health. And our clinicians in our network were particularly excited about this project. Why were they excited? Because it gave them an actionable resource to address lead hazards in kids. Primary care and pediatrics, I would say the P in those things are both synonymous with prevention. And so we were really excited that we could build what's called a clinical decision support tool. Has everybody heard of that term, clinical decision support? It's exactly what it, it, it says. It's a tool or aid to help clinicians make the right decisions on behalf of their patients. So what's really amazing is that we can take this wonderful model that's been built from all the work of our valuable collaborators and put it right in front of clinicians as they're navigating through an electronic health record. So if I am an OB provider and I see a pregnant woman, I can actually navigate to this point in the electronic health record. I can choose to run the risk analysis and I can receive information on if that child is likely to be born in a home that is at a high risk for lead exposure. And from there, as Tom just mentioned, we can act upon that information and actually schedule a visual lead inspection of their homes by engaging the city's help and the Department of Public Health um, assistance as well. So providing providers or clinicians an actionable tool is a wonderful asset to them because many of these frontline providers who are my colleagues, um, they do a lot of advocacy on behalf of their patients with legal assistance programs for kids who have been lead poisoned. So to give them an alternate approach before a child is ever uh, poisoned is such a valuable asset. Um, the only other thing I'll say is that in addition to using the risk model, this also prompts uh, clinicians to have an opportunity to discuss other modifiable risk factors in the homes of kids with lead. So all in all, it's a wonderful project that we're very, very proud to be a part of, and uh, thanks to all. So that's it for our prepared materials. Thank you for everybody from the Department of Public Health, uh, we have a few of the team members and the data scientists and project managers who worked on this project. I think a total of nearly 20 people have worked on this project over the past four years. So it's a magnificent project that tied together community action and an important topic. So thank you very much for having us. It's been fun to share this with you all. Hi, my name is Troy Hernandez. I'm a uh, data scientist at IBM, but my PhD is in machine learning from UIC and I live in Pilsen. I'm uh, part of the Pilsen Environmental Rights and Reform Organization. And an issue we've been working on pretty intensively has been the lead in the water from the water main replacements. Um, there's a study, for those who don't know, in 2011 by the Flint whistleblower um, about Chicago before he blew the whistle in Flint, showing that the lead, uh, the water main replacements jacked up lead levels for various reasons, which are too long to go into. Um, as I talked to some of the data scientists who created this model, it doesn't seem like they took into account water main replacements or um, uh, water meter replacements, which would both increase the lead levels. So when I talked to the city officials about this, their response is that 80% uh, of lead poisoning comes from paint. Um, but that study is f almost 40 years old. So it seems like we have a really great opportunity to do a study, just simply adding a variable or two to the, to the model that shows uh, if the water main was replaced or not, or if the water meter was replaced which would indicate that you know, we would expect the lead levels to go up. Um, we could just run a simple linear model and have that answer. Uh, so because we've kind of done water main replacements with kind of not randomly throughout the city, but uh, enough throughout the city, um, it's, we almost have it, a natural experiment, as the economist <laughs> called it. So it's a great opportunity, and I hope you guys can put that in the model and, and we can actually have an answer because this is a huge problem nationwide. Yeah, so I, I can start off with that anyway. So yeah, thanks for the question. I think, um, you know, certainly we are interested in all potential sources of lead poisoning. And I think anybody who has been following the news, part of the reason, you know, everybody raised your hand was because I think Flint really did bring this out as a concern. Um, I think for us, one of the things that we've been really focusing on is where, again, we have somewhat limited resources at the health department. Where can we put the best resources to actually prevent this problem, like we were saying? And so knowing that um, when our inspectors go into the homes, 
their, their, their entire job is to figure out how did this child get lead poisoned. And so when they go in, they're literally, they're not just sort of looking around. What we were saying is we do a visual inspection is kind of the, fir the first piece of this, but they're, they're using machines to look at every window and every door and every part along the way. And um, we are also sending water from, uh, you know, from that same home. Um, if we don't identify a source of lead uh, in that child's home, most of the, the great majority of the time we identify a lead paint hazard that needs to be fixed. If we don't, we say, where else does this child spend time? And we go to grandma's house and we go to the neighbors and we go where it may be. Um, I think there certainly are, um, you know, lead in, lead in water, lead in all of our environment is certainly of concern. But where we see the biggest impact for really trying to prevent lead poisoning in kids in Chicago, and where I want to put my inspector's time, um, at least you know right now with what we have available, does remain uh, primarily on the lead paint. How did you communicate the prediction results to other stakeholders who did not have much understanding of the model and or the algorithm? What questions were you asked about your predictions and how did you answer them? Did the concerns about communicating the results affect your choice of algorithm? It's a fantastic question. I, there was a point in this project where we spent uh, quite a bit of time thinking about how to communicate the risk results, because it's not an absolute level of risk when we say what's elevated. It's to a certain baseline. And in fact, one of the things that's key about this project, a key question, I think that the question is alluding to, is what is that baseline? And so, for instance, when we work with Alliance of Chicago, we're taking a look at that baseline. It was what does elevated look like compared to uh, other folks who come to Alliance of Chicago? Uh, what is the relative baseline for the folks who are, or what was the federal program that we were based on? WIC. Uh, children who are part of the WIC program are elevated level. So what is that baseline? So I mentioned, alluded to earlier, we use a relative risk ratio. This is a, a, a ratio that, in communication with clinical staff, doctors are data-informed individuals. They've, they've taken statistics classes. They have a general sense of what relative risk looks like and what that ratio kind of is communicating. So we thought about who's gonna be consuming this information, primarily clinicians. We've talked a lot about what is that baseline when we talk about elevated risk, and we're trying to use those baselines that best mirror the population that we're trying to model. Uh, and, and that has been able to seem to be successful in terms of communicating, okay, what is the relative risk of this individual uh, patient? But second, we put a lot of emphasis, as, as soon as we do find that somebody is of that elevated level, communicating clear instructions about what to do associated with that is the other piece of this as well. So when you see that there's a couple of standard deviations above risk, what is, what is that actual action being done? And we also display that prominently as well. So there's no real confusion, not a lot of time trying to interpret, is this really high or kind of high, but what is that action that can be done? Hi. So uh, I have two questions. The building the machine learning model is the ongoing process, right? So first you train the model and then you make sure that it has the precision and recall as you want. But then like after you know that, okay, the model is good and you deploy it to the production, uh, how do you monitor it and make sure that the prediction is consistent with that initial training model, in initial training data, and there's no change to that? And also the second part of the question is like uh, monitoring that, do you see the change in the trend of the data? Like if that prediction start to shift or like maybe behavior of the people or that effectiveness of the feature that you use change over time? So the first part of your question is, how do we monitor the model? So uh, what we're doing is we're producing a risk, uh, a list of the riskiest children. So as we retrain the model, we can see how that list is changing. So now if that list is changing dramatically, then we might see that there's a problem in our model and that there might be an issue with the input in the data. So that way we can actually um, monitor our model that way. Now, so we shouldn't see too large of a shift um, in our risk over short periods of time. Now, secondly, you'll see that the, pro the sort of problem of lead poisoning is sort of, um, you'll see there's a decrease in lead poisoning over time. So you'll see that your baselines are just going to decrease over time. So the second part of your question, what does that ongoing monitoring look like, uh, is a really good one and something that is important for anybody who's a data scientist in grad school or undergrad. 
how to operationalize a model and what that looks like after the six months, after a year, after a few years, is one of the toughest problems that sometimes doesn't get taught very much. Uh, but I mentioned, again, kind of obliquely, that we're storing those predictions in a database precisely so we can go back and continue to reevaluate what does that model fit. We're working with Alliance Chicago right now. That's the baseline population that we're working with. As we expand this to other health networks, we need to make sure that as we expand the populations being covered who are visiting these uh, health service centers, that uh, health centers, that 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 model continues to perform with a certain amount of fidelity, at least so we can evaluate that on an ongoing basis. So we're storing those predictions. We're going to continue to get blood lead level results from the state and from tests that happen and the inspections that happen, and we're going to use that to further make further evaluate our model. Uh, what is the cost of family for inspection and remediation, and does the city help cover these costs? Sure. Um, so. Great question. Anybody who's thinking about cost, you're thinking right in the right in the right in the sweet spot. So there is no cost to the to the family for the inspection, um, and in fact. Um, it doesn't even, if a child already has an elevated blood lead level, even if a doctor never calls us, even if nothing happens officially, that data comes to us and we show up at the door. We send letters to um, the owner or to the tenant and the owner if necessary. We knock, we come back, we hang door hangers. Um, and there's some law that lets us actually get in and test uh, to try to protect this child's health. So that's done at no cost. Um, and then depending what we find and depending what the situation is, um, um, there can be requirements to actually remediate that. And so in a lot of cases, um, that would be on the owner or that would be on um, the landlord in some cases to make those repairs. Um, and a lot of the, in a lot of cases, that, that is where it falls. Um, we do have a grant program. We get some money from um, HUD, federal money from the Housing and Urban Development, where we have a grant program for um, either owners or tenants who are low income and meet some other requirements um, where the city will actually pay for the full cost of remediation for lead or other environmental hazards um, in the home. It's a relatively small number of people. I always wish we had more money, but we prioritize the folks um, who don't have other resources to pay for it. But in a lot of cases, um, we're working we provide, um, our inspectors also, you know, help teach uh, safe remediation if it's sort of a low, low level situation. Um, and we help uh, families or owners find contractors who have the appropriate um, expertise to uh, remediate the hazards um, safely and appropriately. So um, no cost for inspections and variable cost ranging from zero to, you know, whatever may be required. Um, but it is a requirement to make these homes lead safe if a child has been lead poisoned in them. I am Monica Eng from WBEZ. Dr. Awadi, you mentioned that you do do some water testing in the homes of the children with elevated levels. Do you have that data and is it shareable? So the Department of Water Management is the one that owns the, you know, all data related to water testing. Um, I think if you want to follow up with us outside of this, we can, you know, go back and forth about this. But like I was saying up front, you know, our goal is to identify what you know, what poisoned that child. And so um, particularly in a setting where we wouldn't find uh, a lead paint hazard, we would be looking, you know, very closely at water. And we offer that water testing. And folks should know, by the way, that, you know, anybody who um, is concerned about their water can apply to the Department of Water Management and you can get free water testing of your own water also. So just something to be aware of in general. Um, but that's run through water. We, our data mostly is falling in the cases of kids who have sort of already been lead poison so we're at a different level of investigation in that case but um, looking at looking at um, uh, water as a potential source um, is certainly a piece of the investigation that we do but I'll tell you what we're finding you know the huge majority of times are these lead paint hazards um, that can and, and should be fixed so that is why the majority of our focus does remain there all right thank you very much thank you for this important project